Hey everyone, and welcome back. So like I mentioned in our intro, today's guest is someone who I've come to know both personally and professionally, and also someone that I believe really demonstrates the immense value of gaining self-understanding through reflection and also just doing the work. You know, everybody has their own baggage that they carry, and some of us have scars, and the difference between it being a scar versus an open wound is the work that you're willing to do to get there. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Michael to everyone, and Michael, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Aram. I'm really excited and happy to be here. So much of what you and I have talked about um, in your current role and just you know your approach to life is self-awareness. Now, self-awareness is something like, oh, we got to be self-aware. And, you know, like there's that kind of concept, like know yourself. But it actually going beyond just like what people say on the Internet it takes a lot of work. So what was your journey towards having a heightened sense of self-awareness like? Like what got you going down that path? I think what started it for me, Aram, was I got divorced when I was uh, in my early 30s. Catastrophic event for me. Uh, a dream that I had that we all have when we're younger shattered completely. And in the wake of the grief that I went through with my divorce, I realized that I was present for the first time in my life. In the morning after I left my wife and kids, that I sat in a pool of my own tears and I could look around the room that I was in and really be present with the things that were in it for the first time in my life. And I realized in that moment that I had not been living authentically. And I could see for the first time in my life around that I was living inauthentically and I didn't, I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel good about the man that I'd become. And yet there was this voice inside of me that knew that I could be something better, that knew that there was some authenticity there. And for the first time, that pool of tears that I was sitting in opened my eyes to the possibility of that. And that's really where my journey toward uh, my work and, and my becoming more conscious through self-awareness, that's really where it began. So up until that point, you'd been living in this kind of like detached state almost, like you're just a person out doing, like doing the stuff, getting married, having the job, having the house, doing all those things. How did that start for you, that sense of detachment? Was it a societal thing? Was it, with the, ways you, was it the way you were raised? Was it a gendered thing? Were there things that happened in your life? Like what, what created that space of detachment? Well, you know, I can talk to you about this now having done the work. When I was detached, I didn't realize that I was. And what I can tell you about my journey through my childhood, I suffered a lot of trauma. And what I, what I know that our brains do with trauma and, th and experiences in our lives is that it adapts us. And I suffered sexual trauma when I was much younger and a lot of other trauma from a lot of moves that my parents made when I was really young, a lot of bullying, a lot of microaggression things in my life that uh, programmed my brain to have me become a certain way. We've heard of the notion of ego. And ego is really a construct that our brains have for things to adapt us from uh, experiences that make us afraid, that create fear in our lives. Those traumatic events and experiences that I went through as a young child adapted me to become a certain way. And it made my ego very big. It made my ego become who I thought I was. And really, it was my ego that as I progressed to get older, that started to make me be more reactive in my life and operate from that place of reaction and detachment and really put a shroud between me and being present and being authentic. And it wasn't until that catastrophic day that I could see that there was a shroud there, that I wasn't operating from my essence. I wasn't operating from a place of authenticity because of the things that had happened to me and because of the way my brain had had me adapt to become in my older life. So you identify that shroud, right? You, you see it, but this isn't a movie, right? It's not like you see the shroud, you cast it off and you're forever different. You identify the shroud for the first time. You're like, damn, I didn't realize I was living in this 
detached way. You get a glimpse of how you've been living and you get a glimpse of who you could be. But I know that's not the end of the story. So how did you proceed? What was your next step? Well, luckily for me, I had uh, good teachers in my life. And the journey that, you know, I've written about in two books really was a journey that took place over 20 years. And luckily, the voice inside me that knew that there was more, that there was more authenticity, there was more presence, there was a bigger life out there. Luckily, that was strong enough for me to be able to pay attention for, to, to, for teachers to show up in my life. And they did. And it was a very iterative process for me where I started to take a look at other people and how they were living. And I could see that they had uh, more authenticity in their lives. And I could see that they were operating from a place of being far more present. And it, it led me on a journey to doing deeper and deeper work over time. And eventually it led me to a place where I was able to unpack the experiences that I had in my, in my life. You know, and a teacher had said to me that, Michael, the goal for your life is in your own shit. And that triggered something in me. And I started to do a lot of digging into my own past. I started to talk to my parents about who I was as a youngster, what I acted like, what were the experiences that, that happened to me to make me who I am today. And it started me on a journey to really understand and see that some, some traumatic things had happened in my life and made me become who I was. And the, the root of it all around was shame. Shame for being who I was when I was younger and being ashamed of who I was because of the things that happened to me had started to create this shroud between me and the outside world. And it had, it had me start to be looking more uh, inward at myself and being a little less extroverted than maybe I would have otherwise been had those things not happened in my life. And so it was really a journey to unpacking those experiences and understanding where did that shame come from? How did that, how did that take root in, it, in, in adapting me to, be, to become who I was later in life? This journey, because and I know the journey never ends because we're always trying to become better and better versions of ourselves where, you know, we continue to do the work. But this part of it, this kind of like pulling off the shroud and being in touch with those teachers and doing that deep dive. How long did that last? That was probably about 20 years of, of work uh, that I did to get to to where I am today. And, uh, you know, different teachers and different things that I learned and you know, it was a little bit at a time to allow me to go to younger years. I had to deal with who I was later in my life. And I had to deal with parts of myself that I just didn't like. I had to forgive parts of myself that I hadn't yet forgiven in order to be able to find a way to like myself. I had to, I had to, I had to forgive who I'd become in my life, especially later in life when I'd done things and I'd operated in a way and I'd hurt people and I'd hurt myself, you know, a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, a lot of ways that I was operating because I was covering up so much of the suffering that I hadn't learned how to let go of and to let out later in my life. So in that process, that like 20 years of hard work, uh, were there stumbles? Were there times where you continued to like, do things that you wish that you'd said I wasn't going to do anymore? Or were there times where you ever retreated and said like, God, I, I just can't take this on? Were there times you ever gave up on yourself or was it always a consistent move forward? Oh, no, no. <laughs> there were definitely a lot of times that I, that I gave up and I just got tired. You know, I got tired of revisiting my past to try to understand why I was the way that I was and, and why I operated the way that I did. And there were definitely times when I reverted much later in doing the work. So 15 years into doing that work, I had to look myself in the mirror and say, you've done all this work and you say you want to be this man. You say you want to have a woman in your life. You say that you want to have real love and yet 
you're repeating the same patterns again. I had to sit with that. I met the woman of my dreams, which is my current wife at Ram, and I had to wake her up one night at 5.30 in the morning. I had to come clean with absolutely everything. And that was a moment in, in time for me that I really knew the work was about to begin. Even though I'd done so much work up until that point, I knew there was, there was something there that happened when I was much younger that I hadn't gotten to yet. There I was, after confessing all these things with my wife, she's holding my head and I'm sobbing and it hit me. I'd been sexually abused by a man multiple times at 11 years old and I shut that out completely. And not only had I, had I shut that out around, but of course, without understanding the impact of that sexual trauma in my life, I couldn't forgive myself for who I became to survive with what happened to me. There I was with my, 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 my wife and her holding me, that really difficult part of my journey began. So in doing that work, you developed a desire to help other people, you know, and uh, when did that start for you? That started probably in my late 30s, you know, probably six to seven years into doing work. There was, you know, a part of me and a, a part of a lot of psychologists and people who are healers, they look to heal other people because there's a subconscious avoidance of the work that we still have to do on ourselves. Oh, yeah. And it, it becomes a band-aid. It certainly was that for me. It took me quite a journey of, of helping people, putting band-aids on their lives, trying to fix people because I was putting band-aids on my own life and fixing myself. And it wasn't until later in my life that I got to the real healing, the real trauma, the real things that had created fears in my life. Because our fears are really the root of what makes us behave the way we do because our brains drive so much of our day-to-day -day behavior. And it wasn't until I got to that that I really, I could really sit with in my life today and really embrace being a healer, but really know what healing means at a deep level for people. Yeah. Can someone truly be a healer until they know what it means to heal themselves? I don't think so. I think they certainly can. I think it's noble, Ram. I think the world needs more people who are willing to try. You know, the willingness to help people is really what will continue to drive the world in a direction that it needs to go. True healing, though, true healing really comes from and is born from, you know, our ability to be able to heal ourselves. Because how can you how can you have the learning if you haven't done it for yourself? You know, I, I do think that there's noble causes. The true and the deep work, though, you know, it has to start with us. It has to. Yeah. Part of what you and I connected on when we first met was kind of both of our backgrounds of being of service to other people and people who had experienced things similar to what we've experienced. Things that I experienced not involving sexual trauma, but a, a lot of like young trauma that led me into like addiction and all the stuff that we've talked about. That helping initially for you was group work with men, one-to-one -one work with men, kind of like mentorship. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. So when did the idea of writing enter into the, into the equation? When I realized what a blessing, what a gift that I had been given by the universe, by the earth, by teachers that had showed up in my life, the coincidences of meeting people at a certain time in my life when I needed them, you know, the angels that showed up to heal me when I needed them. There was this compelling sense of really to give back and to tell the story of my healing. And to be able to give that to people in a way that they could actually do something with it. And, you know, part, that, that was the genesis of writing the books was really to be able to, first of all, very cathartic for me to write it. And the writing of it, very cathartic for me. Certainly a big part of my journey was in the writing of my own story. But being able to write it in a way that people could actually do something with it, an offering of sorts. Here's things that happen. It may be happening to you. And here's a path. Here's a roadmap. Tell us about the first book. The first book was really born from what I'd seen in men systemically through, you know, a lot of mentorship of younger men 
through a lot of the, you know, the healing that I was doing at that time in my life, I really saw that the masculine in today's world has become to reject all that is feminine. What I mean by that is expression of emotion and being able to freely express, being able to be vulnerable. That was perceived and is perceived as weakness in men. You know, so I wrote the book, Why Don't Our Dads Cry? That was born in me because I'd seen this systemic issue with so many men that I'd seen because it was that way for me. I had a really hard time, you know, seeing vulnerability as something that required courage or strength. For a lot of my life, I saw it as weakness. Even though I wanted to go there, there was this societal, cultural pressure to not go there, to not exhibit and express emotion. And that was the genesis for the, for the first book, really. Around expressing emotion, it, it's an interesting thing in the work world because we could say like modern society there seems to be a lot more acceptance, openness, even expectation for men to like really be much more in touch with their emotional space and share. However, in the work world, you know, like think how many times you've heard people say about someone else, like, oh, they're too emotional. They're too sensitive. Oh, you know, like, oh, I don't want to deal with that person. They like, you know, they, they always, they always get so upset and so messy. And it's too complex dealing with them. And I'd say that there's like a really strong push within the corporate world for people to not be emotional and to, to like be these super buttoned up versions of themselves. And also for everyone to act a certain way, regardless of what background you're from, what ethnicity you're from, be these like almost mechanical acting people who could just go and make transactions happen day after day after day. Where do you think that tipping point is between what our society now seems to be saying like, hey, no, really men should be in touch with their emotions and should express them and should be in that space. The change we've seen there versus what goes on in the corporate world behind the scenes. I think the first thing to look at Ram is why are things the way they are and history is really serves us to take a look at that especially in the work world and I'll go back to the 1830s from 1830 to 1920 there were 42 million people that emigrated to North America from Europe and they were running from the most horrific conditions imaginable the potato famine is one of them so many others though they were running from some horrific conditions they got here and most ethnicities were racialized, they were prejudiced against. They got to a, you know, the land of the promise, the gold rush, the land of opportunity, a place that you can have land. And when, when they actually got here, it was a harder, more cold place than where they came from. The men, because men went to work in those days, it was the men that had to go to work every day. And it was the men that had to forget what they came from. It was the men that had to start to clam up and close off in order to survive, in order to do the horrific work that they had to do every day, just to not starve with their families. They had to clam up. They had to not express emotion. And I think that through the generations, I mean, that's 1920. Now you're into the Industrial Revolution. I think that that just continued on that path within the professional environment to where the white collar world, male dominated world, we haven't scratched the surface yet. I think the, the circles that you and I run in, and we talk about vulnerability and emotional expression, I think that that's still very much a minority around. I, I think that there's so many of us that have to continue to lead by example, but I think it's still really prevalent in the work world because that's almost 200 years of the way things have been. And, you know, we have, we still have a lot of work to do in order to be able to get there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that kind of drives me crazy, although I, I do try and like, I try and temper this side of myself is like company marketing. All the companies now like, oh, vulnerability, mental health, blah, 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 blah. And then someone like me who works with a whole bunch of different companies, I see the working conditions. It's like, nah, you're kind of full of shit. Like, you know, like, yes, you say that on Instagram or you say it on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever, but I know what's really going on. And what's going on is the same thing that was going on last year and the year before and the year before that with slightly different language, slightly different approaches. I see people getting beat down, tons of anxiety, overworked. They need to take a pause. People are questioning their commitment. It's like, no, that, that really doesn't have anything to do with what you're saying on LinkedIn. And it's kind of the same thing I see with like a lot of organizations or corporations, like how they support whatever the political thing is at the time, 
because it's safe for them now to do it. So for example, a lot of companies for many years now have been supporting Pride Week or Pride Month or any of these things. It's like, yeah, but where were you like 20 years ago or 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago? You weren't out there flying the rainbow flag, but you had people within your organizations that you were expecting for them to like shut up about their personal life and don't talk about, you know, your same sex marriage or or not even marriage because that wasn't legal at that time. And these ideas that corporations kind of position themselves in these ways when it's convenient and easy to them so that they can position themselves so they can get more business. But in the reality, it's like, hey man, racism still happens in the work world. Homophobia still happens in the work world. Transphobia still happens in the work world. People who express emotion and express vulnerability are still clowned on and marginalized. So how do we push past that tipping point? And I want to, let's keep it more around like the awareness, uh, self-awareness, vulnerability, emotion. And I certainly don't expect that you or me or anyone has the answer, but how do we make that change happen in our business world? In order to, to make the shift, we've got to hit business where it matters most. And that is obviously going to be the bottom line. And we, we know that high performers are emotionally intelligent people. And I think we've got to continue to push on what emotional intelligence is. And emotional intelligence, when you know you look at the definition of that, is a whole bunch of things. It is certainly Priority number one, there is a level of self-awareness that someone has in order to have a high EQ, in order to be a high performer. And I think if we continue to point to high performing people having high EQs and emotional intelligence, then we can point to the need for self-awareness. And I think if we can point to the need for self-awareness, we can start to look at the words on walls, which are values and mission statements, and we can start to say, hey, are we really living that? Are we really embodying that? If we really want to attract people who have IEQ and have high self-awareness, then we've got to walk the walk ourselves. We've got to do this every day in order to set the right example for the people that we're, we're actually leading. And, you know, not to pump your tires too much, but of course I like pumping your tires. Uh, you're someone who really does that. You know, you really, from our first conversation, you are, have no problem putting your real story out there and, you know, anything and, and also doing it in an appropriate way. So you're not your first conversation, you're not leading with all the super heavy stuff, but as we've gotten to know each other and I know in your, in your work world, you let people know who you really are. And as appropriate, you let them know like what your life story has been, the high points and also some of the things that have uh, resulted in, in trauma as someone who's done it, who's lived it and who also made the switch from being totally closed off to actually being increasingly open. Has it cost you anything? Have there been any times where people have pushed back against you or that it, it created a bad situation for you? Yes. Yes, there, there, there has been. I think, you know, earlier in my career and earlier in my journey towards self-awareness, there was this massive amount of satisfaction that I got from doing the work, from becoming more self-aware in the early days, you know, imagine breaking through, you know, the first few layers of an onion and that being the juiciest part of the onion. And that's the way that it was for me. I, I, I broke open some things in myself and I was just alive for the first time in my life. And I was in a work environment. We were an entrepreneurial organization at the time. I started to express that with everybody. In hindsight, it was early on for me and probably, you know, a little immature of me to be expressing things the way that I was, yeah, right, right. but I was coming from a good place and I was so expressive with, you know, the things that I'd gone through in my life and why I was the way that I was. And I was sharing this with people in hopes that it would benefit them too. It was met with a lot of microaggression. It was met with a lot of passive aggressiveness. It happened over a, you know, a several month period of time. And it ended up really hurting me. It hurt me inside. You know, I shared myself and, you know, with people that I was close with and people that I was also friends with outside of work, it ended up hurting me. And I ended up retracting in the workspace. I regressed in my, my evolution of things. And, you know, I ended up acting in ways that when I look back on it now, I realized I became controlling, you know, I became the kind of leader that I now look at and say, you know, there's a lot of development work to do there. 
I can look at it now and say that vulnerability is something that is needed in the workplace. And I think the emotional maturity and the emotional intelligence as a part of that, of when and how to express in the workplace, I think that that's, that's a healthy balance there. You know, and I can say that from my own experience. Yeah. And that for me, you know, I talk a lot about the idea of preference versus authenticity. So there's all sorts of things we prefer and we prefer them because they're natural. They're natural for us. When we're doing those things, we often feel they're the right, like it's right, but often it's right because it feels good. Like it feels like, ah, oh, just, it feels right. And people often refer to that as authenticity. I push on that. I think some things that we prefer are dead on. Yes, you should be doing that. And I think some things we prefer are actually terrible ideas and you shouldn't be doing that. Like I prefer to eat ice cream all day, every day, but I should not do that five days or six days or seven days a week because that is not going to end well for me. When I think about preference, I think about preference that's working versus preference that's indulgent and is kind of stimulating the wrong part of yourself. Where I come into authenticity is the idea that anything from my perspective can become authentic to us as long as it doesn't cross a moral or an ethical boundary. And the way that it becomes authentic doing something is by figuring out how to do it. You do it again, you do it again, you kind of find your way through it. Yeah. It's like riding a bike. Yeah. First time you hopped on a bike, you didn't just ride off. You had to fall down, you had to try it again, you had to figure it out. But the thing about that, that journey through authenticity is like, as you're figuring it out, it doesn't feel good. And in fact, there's a lot of things as you're trying to make something authentic that may never feel good. You figured out how to do it as yourself, but you wish you could do it the way that you just want to do it. And when I think of expressing vulnerability in work, and being more emotional and kind of expressing that side of us. Something I think is really important is like, you can't just go from like zero to 10. Like we think a spinal tap, we're not gonna go to 11. We just can't do that. That to me is that preference space. It's like, I've learned this thing and now I wanna share it with everyone. I've seen a lot of people in recovery do that where it's like, oh, you're sober and now you're gonna get in everyone else's shit. Instead, the authentic thing to do is learn how to talk about those things and then pursue that path rather than just being on 11. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I think of it like the, you know, putting the, putting your foot on the gas pedal, you know, all the way to the floor versus, you know, doing 15 miles an hour in a school zone and and Mm -hmm. easing, easing into it. And now vulnerability for me is, is saying to my team, Hey, I don't have this figured out. You know, I'm new to this industry. And I, I don't know. I've got I've really got to lean on you to be able to help me find the right answers and the right solution. That's vulnerability. That gives people access to being imperfect, to being present, to being OK with making mistakes. Organizations and businesses, they want ideation. They want they want ideas. They want all of these things. If we're not vulnerable as leaders. And we don't give people access to making mistakes and being imperfect, then we won't get that kind of environment. We won't get that kind of culture. You know, so it doesn't mean that I've got to show up in my first day and say, hey, I was sexually abused and I was 11 years old. I I can talk about the fact that I don't have it all figured out. Mm, You know, that that's that's and that. But that comes from the place for me, Aram, of. Being okay with that because the younger part of me wanted to be perfect, wanted everybody to like me. I fought so hard to be perfect in everybody's eyes. The work that I've done has allowed me to show up like that for people in bite-sized chunks that they can digest. And would you mind if I add to that for a sec? Of course. Something I think about too is like when people are trying a new thing, like okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be more vulnerable or I'm going to express myself and, you know, and I'm going to be in this space when they get the first piece of like bad feedback or, you know, like a couple pieces of bad feedback. It's like they gather up all their toys. They're like, fine, you don't want that. I'm going to be the most closed off person you've ever seen. I'm going to be like a control freak. I'm going to be this and that. Calm down. I know it's tough, but it's just like anything else. You got to do it through iteration. Like you got to take that feedback. If you want to really bring that in and be who you are, 
you got to figure out how to do that. And that means you're going to get some tough feedback. You're going to bruise shins. You know, people are going to like you. People are going to dislike you. People are going to like use you to kind of rile you up to get you to, to push their point. You're going to learn lessons. But the more that you can embrace that and really roll with it, the more you get to that refined space of being like, oh, this is how I do it. Yeah. So when you get the feedback, you should be thankful. Get mm-hmm. as much more as you can mm-hmm. so you can get to that refining process so that you can really be who you are in those moments. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. And I also think that people don't often know why they're triggered around. So yeah. when you get the bad feedback, it's like you're in grade four right. and you put your hand up in class and you've given the wrong answer and everybody's laughing at you. And that's literally how our brains work. And, all, and now you're getting this negative feedback because you put yourself out there just like you did in class in grade four. Only instead of kids laughing at you, you're getting negative feedback. But our brains and our nervous system – are operating the same way. So I would add to what you're saying is be curious about why you're feeling negative about the feedback. Why is it making you feel the way that you are? Where is that coming from? You know, and if we just wonder on the question of that long enough, the answer usually comes and how we're feeling about it gradually dissipates over time. If you look at the example that I gave you when I was exuberant with all my vulnerability, I got all that passive aggressive and that coldness. What was really replaying was my own childhood. My own childhood was playing itself out in the office environment that I was in. And I completely retracted. I got really aggressive. I got really controlling because that's how I adapted from when I was a kid. Exact same pattern, different environment, but exact same pattern. You know, and it wasn't until I got that self-awareness, the curiosity to understand where that came from that, you know, I could, I could really, I could really be with that. Yeah. And I think this is a great space to, to go down to the second book, because like, you know, we're talking about those, those feelings of like, I'm the little kid put up my hand and then suddenly I feel like shame. I feel embarrassed. I'm like, Oh, I look so stupid now in front of everyone. And then you have that anger reaction or that closing off reaction, all sorts of people. So people who haven't experienced trauma, but maybe they're not used to expressing emotion, how they can have that. But especially people who've experienced trauma and most of us have had some some stuff, like some real stuff. Let's talk about the new book, uh, Shame, Fear, and Shit, the big things that make us play small. Yeah, so this is really, you know, the was me really going uh, deeper and understanding, you know, where my shame came from, where my fear came from, you know, and really the shit part of that is, uh, you know, what are the things that triggered me in my life to operate from that shameful, fearful place? Really, it was about understanding my brain around. I started to do a lot of reading when I was in my own journey about my own self-awareness of why are we this way? Why are human beings this way? We've been on the planet for five million years. And when you consider living in a civilized world for, let's say, 5,000 of those years, that's 0.0001% of the total time we've been on the planet. And the rest of the time, we've literally been prey. We've been prey for other things on the planet. And our brains are programmed that way. And so today's modern day version of the saber tooth tiger is a girl walking down the street with what she feels are the best new clothes in the world that her mom bought her. And the car full of girls drives by and laughs at her. And in that moment, her brain says, oh, wow, we don't want to put ourselves out there ever again. We don't want to wear something new and something funky. We don't want to risk this again. I don't want that feeling. We don't want that feeling. And our brains adapt us. In the moment after that happens, she becomes something different, someone different immediately. And she maybe won't put herself out there as much anymore. Maybe she's a little bit more introverted. And now what the brain does for that young girl is it's looking for things in the environments that she's walking into, new classrooms at school, new friends that she's about to meet potentially. And it's looking for validation that she shouldn't put herself out there. That is literally how our our reptilian part of our brain works. I didn't understand that about myself. I'd always heard that there was a difference between the authentic me and my essence and the egoic part of me, which which is my brain. I really never knew the difference. And I never knew really, you know, we don't think about our kidneys and our livers and our hearts, right? They just do what they do. Well, we don't really think about our brains either. We think that that our brain is us. It's fundamentally different. In that, though, 
Does shame play any good role about helping socialize us in healthy and positive ways? Shame certainly drives us to be better. Shame has certainly driven me to do a lot of things in my life. It drove me to be an overachiever. It drove me to study hard. It drove me to work hard. It drove me to, you know, to be extroverted when I didn't want to be. It drove me to be a, a great athlete. I didn't want to be ridiculed. I didn't want to be looked down upon. I wanted people to like me. It served a part of me that, you know, drove me to do a lot of things to succeed in different ways in different areas of my life. There is definitely a twin to shame that, you know, is that there is some positive there. Yeah. The reason I ask, it's kind of a, an interesting debate for me. I work with a lot of people about moving away from negative motivators like shame, embarrassment, fear, loss towards positive motivators, you know, like uh, fear I'm going to fail. Well, I need to do this or I'm going to fail rather than I'm going to do this because I want to excel, mm -hmm. you know, and like be in that space. But those are kind of like, you know, you're in your career when you're thinking about that. So I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school from like kindergarten all the way to high school. So I know a lot about guilt. And I know a ton about shame because growing up, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty unstable environment, very, uh, a lot of bad experiences when I was young. And those experiences made me carry around a lot of shame about not fitting in and not fitting the mold and kind of always being on the outside. And I watched those things. It was like almost as if I was a spectator in my own life lead me into challenging situation after challenging situation and challenging situation. And it was really at one point where I was like, all of this stuff is going because I'm trying to. I'm using shame as a motivator. I'm trying to, I feel the shame. So I'm like, I'm not going to be like that again. And then I create this big foundation of all of these things I'm going to do, but I find myself back in the same place. It was only when I started to move towards what I, what I call positive motivators, like really like focusing on self-acceptance, focusing on forgiveness, on forgiveness of myself and others, all those things that I could really actually do positive motivators. Otherwise, before that, I was just like, I'm going to be positive, but I couldn't do it. I just literally couldn't do it. It was always negative motivators. And those negative motivators pushed me to huge success and like doing all sorts of cool stuff. But what it kept me from doing was enjoying it and being my best self and like feeling good about who I was and what I was doing. It always made me want to set up the next success and the next thing so I could yeah. uh, like continue going with it. And I'm a firm believer that shame is shame. And I don't believe serves a good focus in our lives unless it's something that you've done that is truly a shameful thing. And then even from then, the focus is then on the learning, the healing, the getting better and the moving. So I'm much more about the positive motivators, but I don't ever want to discount, you know, if people have different opinions on that. Yeah. No, I think that, uh, you know, shame for me has, you know, played an enormous role in who I've become in my life. I mean, the, the etymology of the word shame is actually shroud, you know, and it is, it is, if you, if you do your, your homework in psychology, shame is literally the most acutely visceral emotion that we feel. And it is, it is the one thing that our brains become the most afraid of because it is literally like being in the wild, being chased by a saber toothed tiger. At all costs, our brain wants to avoid a shameful thing happening again. And so it shapes us to becoming somebody different. And, you know, with the shame that I felt about myself in my life, Ram, you know, I got more and more detached from myself, first of all, but I got more and more detached from people. As my ego and the construct of my brain became more of my, of my identity, I was less and less present in my actual life. And I, I was either living from the past or I was putting a future out there, uh, you know, some state or ideal that I was living toward because I didn't know how to be in the present because I didn't know how to be with myself. I literally didn't didn't know how to be with myself because I, I didn't like myself. The people that I became, you know, as I adapted to the shameful things that happened to me later in life, I didn't like and I had a very hard time forgiving. And it wasn't until, if we look at the sexual abuse that I suffered, it wasn't until I went back to consider that young boy in the moments after that happened, how lonely I was. And it wasn't until I considered that I had to survive somehow, the most lonely 
feeling, isolated feeling of my life. And my brain adapted me to become someone different. And it wasn't until I got the impact of that experience and how it had robbed me of so much humanity in my life with sexual development, intimate relationships, loving myself, knowing what love was, and really grieve that, grieve the impact of that in my life. Not until then could I really forgive myself for who I became. And not until then can I really actually love myself for the fact that I'm just a a practicing human being. And I could really let myself off the meat hook of somebody that I always thought I should be. And I could actually just be me. And, (laughs) you know, in the magic of that, I get chills now just thinking about it. You know, it's just that simple. Yeah. And speaking of that and, and getting to that place, if you're going to think like personally or professionally, What's been the greatest result for you, the greatest success that you've had from being vulnerable and having this level of self-awareness? It's definitely the relationship that I have with my wife, Ryan. Because of what happened, you know, to me when I was younger, I didn't love myself. And in not loving myself and feeling ashamed for who uh, I was, I didn't feel lovable. And when you don't feel lovable, it's really hard to let love in. You know, you can say it. And you can you can try to practice it, but it's really not it's not in your life. She is the she's the one miracle of my life that my self awareness has unfolded to where I can really let myself be seen by her. All of my wounds and everything, I can allow this person to see all of me, and I can let myself be loved by her. You know, I will tell you that there are stratospheres of love for just one person that unfold as you unpack yourself and you get to know yourself and you get to love yourself. And the more work that I've done, the more that I have just allowed love to come into my life and show up in my day-to-day relationship (laughs) in my domestic home with my wife. And who knew that that would be the miracle of my life? But it is. It absolutely is. Yeah. And what about professionally? What's been the result of this for you professionally? Well, professionally, because of what happened when I was you know, younger and because so much of what happened to me was male influenced, I had a hard time working with males in the work environment there was a lot of triggers that would come up for me. And so, you know, I was always very reactive in the work world and I could operate at a high level, but when those triggers were there, I was definitely performing, you know, at a, at a lower level than I would if they weren't. It's really allowed me to have some freedom, you know, being able to work. It's really allowed me to be able to see when those triggers are there you know, be able to talk to people like you, you know, so I can work through them. And that kind of awareness has just allowed me the freedom to be me, you know, and there, the, the weight, uh, that's no longer there because I can just be me around is immense. It's the greatest gift. It really is the greatest gift. I so appreciate you coming on the show and sharing uh, all of the things you shared today. And of course, you you truly walk the walk here when you're talking about being vulnerable. As we're closing off, I have three questions for you. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. When you think about like vulnerability and consciousness, like having that self-awareness, I mean, it seems so obvious. Like, hey, leaders should be like this. If you have this, it's going to be a huge benefit to you. You're going to understand other people. You understand yourself. You'll be able to make great business decisions. But why is that not the default in the business world? Well, I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I think we're fighting a lot of history. And I think we're fighting a lot of male-dominated culture. I think we're fighting male figures in leadership positions that are older. And I think the the generations of men have handed down a lack of uh, emotional expression. And I think that the culture has fostered to express emotion is weak. And, and I think that that's still prevalent in, you know, in today's leadership world. And I think it's going to take us these kinds of conversations and people like you and I walking the walk to slowly make a difference out there in the work world. Heck yeah. I love that. All right. 
Second to last question. I see some guitars on mm-hmm. the back wall there. So, man, top three songs, records, or artists, and I know that could change tomorrow or the day after the day after, so I won't hold you to this, but top three songs, records, or albums that when you're feeling a little low or a little down or a little like vulnerable in a, in a challenging way and you want music just to soothe you, mm-hmm. What are three songs, records, or artists that you go to? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what comes to mind is uh, Bruce Springsteen, you know, and I, and I really don't have any one song. I so admire his zest for life. You know, when you hear him belted out on stage, you just know he's giving it his all. He's giving it everything. And I think that when I'm, when I'm being a little reflective and I'm thinking about people that I love my life, Van Morrison is definitely somebody that I that I love and I, I appreciate. You know his his zest for life as well. You know I could I can't leave out the Tragically Hip. I mean the Canadian iconic band, man. <laughs> Especially living in the U.S. now, my wife and I will sit in the backyard and just belt out the hip, and it just you know we get up dancing and just love life, love life. <laughs> yeah. You know the Tragically Hip. First of all, great list. Tragically, the hip is like such a Canadian thing that like I grew up in Calgary. This band could sell out two nights in a row at the Saddle Dome, like totally sell out the Saddle Dome two nights in a row. And nobody like across the border has any idea who this no, band is. It's no. like, that's insane. No, Ram, I went to see the Tragically Hip in New York City seven times with about 200 people. <laughs> that's crazy that's so crazy to me um all right my man so last question uh you know we get a lot of different people that come to this podcast we've got people who are just business people ceos right down to the front lines um we've got people who are artists people who come from the music scene people who are athletes people who are um social activists so a lot of different kinds of people listen to this podcast but they all come here for the same thing and that's conversations about leadership as we're closing off, is there anything you want to share for this audience from your perspective about leadership? Leadership takes courage. You know, it takes, it takes accountability. And I think for us to be, you know, accountable in a leadership role, I think that we have to take accountability for ourselves and our, in who we are in our, in our lives, not just at work. Who I am at the office is, is who I am at home. And I don't distinguish between those two people. And I think that that, that takes a lot of courage. And I, and I would say, though, that germane to our entire conversation around is it's so needed right now in the world and that I would urge people to have the courage. And I would also say that things are changing. There is a, there is a shift. There is more emotional intelligence and awareness and a vulnerability that is that is being expressed out there as a, as, as a way of building culture. And so I would just urge everybody who's listening to, to have that courage and to take small chances, you know, and see how it feels. And if it triggers something in you, be curious about why it's triggered. Where does that come from in you? You know, but continue, continue to do the work because if you can do that at work, it's going to inform who you are and it's going to help you throughout your entire life. And, you know, it's going to help you become a lot more self-aware if you have that courage. And I will just say that I never imagined life being as big, as joyous, as connected, as vast as it is for me. I've chills just thinking about how vast my life is because I did the work, because I had the courage to do it and to, and to put myself out there. Heck yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, everybody, uh, I will see you in the outro. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an incredible conversation. Thank you, Aaron. Loved it. Thank you. All right. And Spencer, drop the beat. That episode was really, really personally important to me. You know, shame is an interesting thing, but that idea of moving away from shame and letting go of shame and finding healing and acceptance so that you can get into a place of positive motivators, uh, I think that's just a great goal for everyone. And for me, it's been a real life changer. You know, Michael 
is such a great example of someone who's not just like putting on stuff for Instagram or social media, like putting up memes and like, you know, kind of like these corny quotes about how great life is, if you could only dare to do this or that. This is someone who's like truly been through it, who's survived things, who became the worst version of himself, recognized that and then struggled and worked to become a better and better version of himself. Uh, For me, that's as inspiring as it gets, and I really appreciate him sharing his story. The thing I want to encourage everyone, and if I go back to the beginning of the episode, we've been going through a wild time because of the pandemic, but also, like, life is tough. You know, things happen. We're moving fast. And if you're getting into that space of pushing down emotion, just pushing it down because I got to do the next thing, there's a toll. There's a bill that's going to have to be paid at the end. I got to encourage everyone, if you can, as you're going through the stuff, try and live it, feel it, process it, be with it. That way you're not carrying around some bill that you're going to have to pay at some point. That way who you could be isn't always being clouded by who you've unintentionally become. That way you can always be in life instead of viewing life as an audience member. So with that, I want to remind everyone that we're produced and edited by Spencer Priest, recorded by Patrick McKechnie, and our design is done by Tammy Levy. So thanks everyone for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond.